director of the Law Medicine Center here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, 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 our uh, presentation today, Legal Challenges in Precision Medicine, uh, and also to Springtime in Cleveland. Um, those of you who are watching remotely uh, from uh, other cities, um, we, we had uh, a, a bit of a snowfall overnight, and so um, uh, those of you who made it here in person are very hearty, and we appreciate it. Uh, we have an excellent program today, but um, let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of this, uh, of this meeting. Um, and it stemmed from a conversations that I had with Peter Pavarini, whom you will uh, meet in a minute, uh, from Squire Patton Boggs in Columbus and former president uh, of the American Health Lawyers Association about um, efforts to uh, bridge uh, the, uh, the academic health law world with the practitioner world. Um, and so this represents really the first effort in that regard. This is the first um, uh, meeting that's been jointly sponsored by the uh, AHLA and uh, uh, an academic institution, in this case, the uh, Law Medicine Center here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, the, um, uh, and uh, so uh, in, in sort of keeping with the idea of bridges, uh, we have with us today uh, scientific experts, uh, we have legal academics, uh, and we have practitioners who will be speaking to us about the, uh, uh, the status of uh, the precision medicine uh, uh, initiative and also uh, the legal challenges um, that, uh, that it uh, has uh, presented. Um, the uh, the uh, meeting today is being webcast, uh, and also a video will be available uh, in approximately two weeks. And also, uh, we're very fortunate to have from Squire Patton Boggs, uh, Kino Patel, who is um, scribing our scribe, and he will be uh, producing a report of the meeting, and we will be hoping to publish that uh, for uh, wider dissemination later. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, one of our speakers, Vince Bonham, who is the uh, si senior advisor to the National Human Genome Research Institute on Health Disparities uh, and Genetics and Health Disparities, was unable to be here because of weather uh, problems in the D.C. area. Um, and we're especially grateful to those of you uh, who came from the D.C. area, notwithstanding uh, the weather problems, uh, so uh, uh, good job. Uh, and so, uh, without more, let me turn the uh, introductions over to uh, my good friend, Peter Pavarini, um, uh, who will uh, be the moderator for the morning, and then I will be the moderator for the afternoon. Good morning. So pleasant to be here. Um, I came in yesterday and had the opportunity to um, teach one of Professor Melman's classes to see the you know, excitement that there is in a new generation of people who uh, want to pursue health law uh, in their professional lives. From the very beginning of my career, which I hate to admit how many years ago that was, I think I have always been attracted to the interdisciplinary approach to problem solving. Um, never wanted to be pigeonholed, and I think for many reasons that's why I, I gravitated towards healthcare. I felt that you couldn't really grasp the totality of what it means to be practicing law in the legal sphere without understanding all the disciplines that come to bear on the subject. So today we're, we're talking about the law of precision medicine as if it is already an established body of law. And we know it's not. We know we're in a very fledgling state. However, I truly believe that the implications for genomic science on the overall healthcare system are dramatic, uh, transformational. Uh, we have a lot of other immediate issues that we're dealing with, uh, not the least of all is the insurance issue, the coverage issues, uh, which were spotlighted in the last several years by the ACA and the continuing debate in Washington. And that's important. I don't want to diminish the importance of that. But I think the, the fundamentals of what uh, precision medicine, genetic medicine, means for patients and for their providers is something that we can hardly begin to fathom. So that's why we took the risk of organizing this conference. Some might say it was uh, a little bit premature. Um, if you ask most of the 13,000 members of the American Health Lawyers what precision medicine is, 
you might get a, a puzzled look. Personalized medicine, they might know. Um, you say genetic, I think they're getting closer, but it's still uh, not uh, a common core subject for most of those in the practicing bar. I think those of you in academia have been following this uh, more intently, and I commend you for that. But I think out in the practicing uh, part of this profession, we, uh, we tend to do what our clients want us to do. And right now, they're not coming to us quite yet for the issues that we're going to be talking about. But I still believe these are important issues and ones that we're going to have to deal with in the coming years. As Professor Melman said, the uh, genesis of this conference was a conversation we had about a year ago. And I, I believe it's bigger than just the subject of precision medicine. And I, I was lamenting uh, the lack of uh, law school faculty uh, involvement in the American Health Lawyers, which uh, if you're not familiar with that organization, is clearly the largest uh, specialty uh, uh, legal association dealing with the education and to some degree standard setting uh, for uh, those who practice in the healthcare field. Now there, are, there is the ABA health law section and a myriad of other organizations and I'm not detracting from them, but I believe we have established ourselves um, as uh, the predominant uh, source of legal education for health lawyers. That being said, we see a dearth of law school professors and others associated with academia because they have their own organizations, because they have other priorities, but we were hoping that there would be some cross-fertilization on a subject like this so that this wouldn't be a, a single one-off conference, but rather beginning of a series of meetings, maybe at different law schools around the country where members of the practicing bar could come together, meet with the academicians, and discuss important issues so that we are cross-training. We're giving you some of the advice that we see from out in the field, and you are telling us what your students are most interested in learning, and we could help you in, in terms of equipping them for their professional lives. Um, to ensure that we are not going to make this a one-off event. Um, my associate, Kinal Patel, is with us. He has been uh, a great support to us in our healthcare practice and has shown a lot of personal interest in this subject. He's done a lot of the research for the paper that I'll be giving this afternoon. But I think it's this younger generation that we really need to listen to as they tell us what they see the future of medicine and healthcare being and how we can help them. So we commend all of you who brave this lovely spring weather to be with us today. Uh, and for those participating remotely, we highly recommend Cleveland in the springtime whenever it arrives. Uh, it's a very lovely place. Uh, we do have flowers out there. They just happen to be covered with snow right now. Uh, but uh, we'll make it warm and enjoyable for those who are here today. And for those of you remotely, we hope that you will follow this. So, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Carolyn Hutter. She is the acting uh, director of the Division of Genome Sciences at NIH's National Human Genome Research Institute. Now, this is a very important division um, because it relates very much to what we're talking about today. It plans and facilitates into the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research to understand the function of genomes in human health and disease. Dr. Hutter has been a participant in several NIH projects, including the Precision Medicine Initiative. And prior to being at NIH, she was engaged in a wide range of genomic research projects. She will be providing an overview of the science and clinical uh, principles that really are the predicate for the subject matter that we'll be covering today, and we thought it's very important that we understand where the science is today before we get into the law and policy. So, Dr. Hutter, welcome, and looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Is there a way, how do I advance the slides? Oh, good. Okay. So as um, 
as a scientist, I, of course, have a PowerPoint presentation, and um, we, we can't survive without them. Um, so it, everyone's been talking about the spring here and the joke, and I have to say that on Wednesday night, it was like a 70-some degree day in D.C., one of those beautiful blue sky days, and I was out in my friend's backyard, and we were having, we were grilling, you know, our salmon and asparagus. Yesterday, there were like, everybody's phones were like, beep, 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 and the emails, and there were tornado warnings, and, you know, kids had to be put in shelters at school. The sky cleared, I got on my plane, and then I had a very bumpy ride in at 10 o'clock last night into what I would really classify as a blizzard. So I feel like um, when I work on, working on the All of Us research program, we sometimes talk about PMI time, where large amounts of things happen in small amounts of time, and I feel like I've just experienced a year in 24 hours, at least from a weather perspective. Um, so for this talk, um, again, I'm focusing on just, uh, this is a high-level background, so for those of you who really sort of are up to speed on precision medicine, I'm not going to probably give you anything particularly new, but I just think it's important for us all to sort of start on a st the same page as we come into the day today. I'll do some introduction and definitions. I'll talk about sort of the four key areas where I sort of see research and clinical applications of precision medicine happening right now, pharmacogenomics, Precision oncology, which is working in somatic cancer space, genomic medicine, and then these large-scale precision medicine biobanks and cohorts. And for the latter, I'll just focus specifically on the NIH efforts of the All of Us Research Program, previously known as the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program. And then I'm not going to go into the ethical, legal, and social implications LC issues. I know that's what the rest of the day is. But I thought I was, I'm just going to have like two slides with multiple bullet points from a, from a scientist perspective of what are the things that we sort of see as major issues. And you'll see there's, there's a number of them. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how I'm clicking. Okay, there we go. Oh, no, how do I go back? I got it. I'm just figuring out the pointer, sorry. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry about this, everybody. I should have practiced before I got up here. Okay, I got it now. So what is precision medicine? And there's several different ways that people define this. This is the sort of NIH definition of, of precision medicine as really sort of an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account not just genes and genetics, and that's one of the things I'm going to say several times in this talk. It's not just genetics but also lifestyle environment in combination with genes. And it's really sort of changing how do we think about approaching the medical care for both for health and for disease that's really based on the uniqueness of individuals rather than sort of taking people um, and as, as equivalent or or sort of at a high level of stratification of the population. Now, that's not the only definition that's out there. Um, another example came from a 2011 National Academies of Science that has the same idea but a slightly different take of it, which is really looking at precision medicine as a new taxonomy, a new way to think about defining disease. Um, that brings in molecular and environmental causes rather than physical signs and symptoms. So rather than looking at how the patient is presenting in terms of symptoms, it's asking about the molecular and genetic basis of the individual and their environmental and lifestyle factors that come in to perhaps redefine how we approach diseases and how we think about addressing, again, um, treatments and prevention for health and disease. Um, one of the things that I'm going to touch on a couple of times in this talk is that one, one of the other key items that came out of the National Academies of Science approach was this idea that underlying all of this and in order to be able to do this, we need to have knowledge networks. We need to really be bringing in and bringing together large amounts of data and information in ways that we hadn't done previously but we're now able to do. And the idea is that working in these knowledge networks do I have a pointer or can you? Okay. Working in these knowledge networks, um, the research, the biomedical research that can happen will really allow for 
the development of these new taxonomies of disease that can come in and impact how clinical practice, oh, thank you very much, can come in and impact clinical practice in looking at how we, diag we diagnose disease, how do we define what disease individuals even have, how do we treat them, and how do we work to improve their health outcomes. And again, we need to start with, and you can't read this, I'm sure, but it's sort of talking about the exposome, the exposure, environmental exposures, signs and symptoms, genomes, um, multiple other um, molecular features, the microbiome, other types of patient data, all of that linked together and bringing in that information in a way that can allow us to change how we're thinking about and defining diseases. Um, I keep doing this wrong. I apologize. Okay. Now, one of the things that was mentioned before is what is, what, are, what is the terminology we're using? Are we calling it personalized medicine? Are we calling it precision medicine? Um, and so this right here is actually um, a Google trend search in terms of which word is sort of more used in from you know the perspective of Google. The red line is personalized me medicine. The blue is precision medicine. I don't actually think that personalized medicine and precision medicine are two distinct things. I think they're different ways that people are talking about the main concept. Does anyone want to guess what happened on this day here? The President's State of the Union in 2015. Okay, and that sort of, he, he sort of adopted which came from that Institute of Medicine, the idea of talking about it as precision medicine rather than personalized medicine. And then, as you can see, since that date, precision medicine's sort of been taking off more as the term of standard. So what is the reason for making that change? Part of it is there was actually a little bit of pushback when you use the term personalized medicine from a clinical perspective to be, you know, as a, as a physician, people are like, I always treat my individual patients as a person. I'm acting on personalized medicine. I'm not analyzing them in a vacuum of other information. What is this that's making this fundamentally different? And part, and the idea was what it is, is it's trying to be more, more specific or more precise in how we're thinking about what a particular patient has. So, so, not, so not everybody with breast cancer has the same, and we can start to talk about, you know, ER positive versus negative breast cancer, but we can get more and more specific or more and more precise in terms of how we're defining the different health and disease states and that can help us then, if we're then able to tailor prevention, treatment, et cetera, in those areas, we might be making more progress. And so the idea is we're not personalizing it to the individual to sort of say, oh, every individual needs to be treated differently. That's already been done. We're talking about being more precise in describing what is the situation that an individual is in in terms of their health and disease state. Okay. So why do we do precision medicine? Why is this something that's sort of um, considered important to think about and study? Well, from a clinical perspective, many diseases currently lack effective preventive strategies, diagnostics, and treatments. We're really wanting to continue to move forward as a medical field, as a research field, as a scientific community. And it's a recognition that the current options don't consider differences among individuals, these genes, lifestyle, and environment, and that perhaps if they did, we would be able to come up with new and, and improved strategies for prevention, diagnostic, diagnosis, and treatment. From a research perspective, we really want to move to these precision medicine knowledge network bases because we need to have enough data to draw on to have the clinical and cl the scientific and clinical evidence to start talking about these key differences. If you only study five people, you're not going to be able to make, you know, very clear statements about what's happening. You know, you really need hundreds or thousands of people or now some, some you know, uh, the, all of his research program is working for a million people. 
And we also need to overcome the siloed data and data resources. You know, we ca I'm from the Genome Institute. We're not going to get anywhere if all we look at is the genome. We need to be able to combine that with all of this other types of information, and we need to come up with ways to overcome that siloing and get the right types of information and the right expertise all working together. Um, so I keep talking about this building a knowledge base, and so I just wanted to spend a little, spend a slide just being a little more specific about what we mean, because it is really a key concept underlying a lot of these precision medicine research efforts. And so what you need to do is first collect this multi-dimensional information on large numbers of patients, sort of as was shown in that little figure you couldn't see very well, get the genomic information together with the EHR d data, with information that pe from you can get from sensors, from people's um, cell phones, if you could connect their Fitbit information, if you could connect GIS to get environmental exposures, get all of that information on a large number of people, put it together in a way that it can be shared with the research community with all of the issues that come around that so that people can analyze it and start to draw from what you get by looking in this large way and use the appropriate tools and apply it in ways that impact both individual and population health. And so one of the key things that's happening is we're really working in the research community in a lot of different efforts to think about how to, how to assemble and what you have to do and what you have to consider in putting together these knowledge bases, which can then, and then you also have to think about how do we then get that information in that last bullet in a way that the clinicians can use it or the public health practitioners can use it and actually make something from those interpretations. Um, so what are the components that people think about going into the knowledge base? There's a lot of different people will say different things. This is the, the um, ideas that came from the, the Oliva's research program, you know, the, the um, NIH approach to this, to think about bringing in genomic data, bring in environmental, I'm sorry, bring in electronic health records, bring in technologies and information so you can pick up on people, think about using all of that with improvements in data science, think about using that in ways that you have patient part, um, partnerships or participants in the study who you can recall, who you can get additional information in, who you can, you can reach out to be involved in different studies how to think about pulling all of that together. And some of that is why is it now? And I'm, my now slide I was realizing when I reviewed this last night is out of date, it's 2014, but it still gets the point across. You know, there was a push in 2004 to consider a national cohort from the NIH, and it, it was thought to be a good idea, but it didn't sort of take off the same way that it sort of took off when it came back in sort of as an idea in 2015. And a large part of that had to do with were we in the point where we were ready to do this? So you can look at this in sort of comparing 2004 to 2014 on a couple of key things that you would want or need to have in order to be able to put together that knowledge base. And so one is if we want to get genetic information on people in 2004, this is always astonishing to me, it still cost $22 million to sequence a human genome. You know, if we wanted to sequence somebody's genome in 2004, that's how much it was going to cost. Today, you know, we're saying at genome sort of in the 12 hundred range. You'll hear people who say less than that. It's, the thing we're now sort of quibbling over is what does it mean to sequence a whole genome? What parts do you care that you missed? How much of the analysis and comp compute and storage costs are you factoring into that cost? But, you know, where we are in the debate over it is, is not on the same order of magnitude as the difference between 22 million, there's no way we would do this on more than one, you know, a reference genome to, oh, this is something we can really start thinking about doing on large numbers of people. And if you do the exome, just the part of the sequence that codes for proteins, that cost drops down into the $500 range. We also can do it much quicker. It took about two years in 2004 for every genome you wanted to sequence. We now do it in less than a day. Um, if you start thinking about the other things we want to layer on, I talked about um, the electronic health record 
and how many people are using it. In 2004, it was about 20, 30 percent. And now, you know, for obvious reasons, because it's of the way it's sort of being mandated and moved forward, it's over 90 percent. Now, that doesn't mean that in the United States we have an EHR that lends itself to these types of knowledge bases the same way that you have in other places. We have a very fractured system. So just to say, oh, the EHR has been adopted doesn't necessarily mean that it's in a position that can inform these efforts the way we might like. We have way more computing power and the ability to think about storing and processing and working with this type of data than we could have even 10 years ago. Um, when you think about the size of the data set, we need to have the infrastructure, the tools, the storage, and the, the know-how, the trained um, research and clinical um, infrastructure and personnel who can work with this types of data. And then we also will say that from a political perspective, we have currently strong bipartisan support for these types of efforts. And I'll talk a little bit later about the 21st Century Cures Act on that. Now I just have two um, misconceptions that are sometimes out there that I just want to clarify and just make sure we're all clear on. So first of all, this concept isn't entirely new. You know, my definitions were talking about it as an emerging field and sort of this, you know, really taking off recently. But we we often have things where we're, not, we're using additional information about people to pick out their treatments. The examples that are often given are, you know, eyeglasses. We don't just give everybody the same eyeglass. We keep, you know, a lot of sort of information goes into deciding what is the appropriate um, sort of correction that people should have. Um, and blood transfusions, we, a lot of information is incorporated before determining who's going to have a blood, when someone's going to have a blood transfusion, whether, A, whether or not they have it at all, and then B, what, who is it from and where, how does the blood transfusion work. This is just taking those types of concepts on a much larger scale and bringing them to many more areas of, of health and medicine. The second is it's not just genomics. It's not just saying let's take, we're not just sequencing people and looking. We're bringing in a lot of other information. So I'm highlighting here the lifestyle and environment part. And this is a paper I'm not going to go into detail about, um, but if you want, I think it still is one of the nicest examples out there of something that really took a personalized approach without actually bringing in um, um, sequence data or, gen or genotyping data or looking at the genome. What they did is they looked at microbiome, data from blood tests, questionnaires, anthropometrics, and food diaries as a way to identify that not everybody um, has the same blood glucose response to eating the same thing. And that there's some people who have, are, are going to have a different response. I, I love the little pictures here. This is rice and this is ice cream. Um, but sort of coming up with ways to identify who are the, what type of glycemic response people have to different types of food to help predict what might be the better types of food that they should be eating. And sort of, again, coming up with this idea that you could have predicting glycemic responses that could identify personalized nutrition and more information on what people should eat. But the idea behind this is it wasn't just like sequence their genome and if you have this variant, eat ice cream, and if you have this variant, eat rice. It's a much more complicated layering of other types of information that can get synthesized together and potentially inform these types of decisions and these types of personalized approaches. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but it wouldn't be fair for me to stand up here and talk about all of the positives and not mention that there's a lot of criticism and skepticism about large-scale precision medicine efforts, and I think we might hear some of them today. I hope that we do. This is just highlighting um, two papers that came out sort of right after the um, presidential address and sort of the movement. One sort of talking about the concern that precision medicine efforts are really focusing on, on treatment and what do you do with people who already have disease and not taking the larger public health perspective. How do we think about public health? Um, and this, is a, this one was a more critical, sort of coming around in a different um, 
with a number of different concerns. Um, but one of the things to note is, are we distracting from the goal of producing a healthier population? Is this an academic exercise that some people are very excited about that's being overpromised, and that the same amount of sort of resource and brain power could impact health going through other directions? I'm obviously a proponent because um, it's something I've been working on, but I did want to sort of note that the the criticism and skepticism is is out there. Okay, so I'm going to go kind of quickly through some different research and clinical areas of precision medicine. So first of all, um, despite all of my, and I will note, let me go back for a sec, oh, okay, I'm doing this again. Despite all of my discussion about um, these efforts, okay, I'm just going to start, stay on the side, about this be, not just being genomics, um, that there is a fair amount of uh, I'm going to start with a, a very genomic example, which is pharmacogenomics. And pharmacogenomics, I passed the definition, is really just looking at identifying drugs and drug responses, oh, there it is, um, focusing on how people respond to medication. And can we use genomic information to help select the correct drug or the correct dosage of drug for different people? So one example is um, abacavir sensitivity. Abacavir is a reverse transcript inhibitor. For those of you who don't know, it's an HIV AIDS medication. About 5%, and it's, it's very powerful medication for that, um, that population, but about 5% of patients who are on this medication develop hypersensitivity reactions from nausea to severe rashes. And these aren't just like, a, you know, these are full body, like I, I actually thought about putting the picture up, but I actually, it's not a pleasant thing to look at for severe hyp, um, reactions to this. Um, and many people, A, they have the side effect, and B, they're not able to be getting the effective treatment. Um, and one of the things that's been found is that 100% of people who have hypersensitivity have a very specific um, HLA allele. So we can tell genetically, now it doesn't mean that everybody who has that allele has a reaction, but the only people who have reactions have that allele. So you can, pre you can prevent these hypersensitivity reactions if you identify who has that genetic makeup and not give them the drug and only give it to people who don't. Um, and current guidelines, FDA guidelines, actually re recommend HLA testing pri um, prior to giving the drug for that reason. So this is a very specific genet pharmacogenetic example. Who, do I give you this drug? Yes, no. Well, let me first look at your genetics and identify a group of people. Not that they're not going to necessarily respond to the drug, but we're trying to prevent the severe um, side effect. And they've actually, this, this graph here is showing... Um, in, is showing within Western Australia, before they did the genetic um, screening, what portion of the population disconnect, discontinued the drug within six weeks, which is typically done due to side effects. And it was in this sort of 5% um, were, were actually, um, dis, five to, yeah, about 5% were discontinuing due to sensitivity reactions. The once um, genetic testing was implemented here, that's what this line represents, it dropped down to almost only one to two percent, sort of showing that they were actually able to successfully eliminate um, the hypersensitivity in people who needed to go off. Now, the thing we have to keep in mind, and this is one of the things that doesn't always get mentioned enough, what do you do then do for these patients? Do we have a, do we have a powerful enough alternative treatment are we setting ourselves up in a way that they're still going to, I mean, the, you know, have, being able to have their HIV AIDS treated? The answer in this case is yes, there are alternative medications. But it is one of those things that I think, especially when we talk about pharmacogenomics, that we also have to keep in mind, is there an alternative available? Um, in, I don't know for this particular drug. In some cases, they are. In which case, did you need to do the genetic testing, or could you do other testing to find it out? Was that part of your question, or? Uh, I think this is, this is a case, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Right. 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 Yeah, I think in this case, I think, and that's one of the situations too where that becomes the question if there isn't an alternative drug available, is there ways that you can then identify them and monitor them more closely? I think in this particular case, it's kind of like um, if somebody has an allergy to penicillin, we often don't, we often just give them alternative um, medications. And so in this case, that's more what's done. But if there weren't strong alternatives, that would be a good way to do it. Or it may also be a case of coming back to my point where I was saying it's not just all about genetics. And if you focus only on that yes, no part, we're simplifying a situation where we would actually learn more from the complexity. Can I uh, just yeah. interrupt for a moment? Um, we are going to take questions, and sometimes we will do it spontaneously spontaneously, but in this case, I think what we need to do is at least have a, uh, some signal so we can bring a microphone over to you so it can be recorded. Otherwise, a lot of this will be lost in the, both the transcription and okay. those uh, listening remotely. So, so we have a question in the back. You mentioned allele uh, or something right. like that. Could you give us a sort of a gene 101 genetic testing? Because most of us only understand genes. <coughs> things called alleles and SNPs. And yeah, so I apologize for that. And I, I, had, I was hoping to, um, and I did trip into it without using a definition. So, so a gene is a set of DNA sequence in the genome that codes for a protein. Okay, and then you can talk about a variant as a single place in the genome where there's variation. So some people are different from others. And you'll sometimes hear them called single nucleotide polymorphisms or an example of a, of a variant, of a place in the genome where if you look at the DNA sequence, some people have one sequence and other people have another. When we talk about alleles, um, Alleles are alternative forms of a variant um, or alternative forms of variation, either a single variant or in the case of HLA, it's actually a very complicated region. So you sort of have the profile of the HLA region and different people have different profiles and those different profiles are named. So B star 57.01 is one way that we describe what the sequence in the HLA region looks like and different people will have different sequence in those regions. They get these different star, um, you know, names, and each of those different things is called an allele. So when, we t when people talk about an allele, they're talking about, it's, it doesn't have to be a single change. They're talking about a representation of a, ver of a type of variation in the DNA sequence in a particular area. Did that help? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I, I, the main thing, the main, let's not use, don't worry much, don't worry about the word allele. I think what we just want to worry about is that we can identify through the DNA sequence what type of, what DNA sequences are associated with the sensitivity. Does that, that's the key message I want you to have from this. And then the, the final thing I wanted to point out, and I'm using the word allele again here, but I'll try not to use it again in the talk, is that diff, the, the frequency of people who have this type of sequence variation that leads to the sensitivity differs by population, by genetic ancestry. If we look at different parts of the world, um, if you look in Japan, nobody has this, this, the variation that's associated with the sensitivity. However, if you look in South America, it's five to seven percent of the population. In Thailand, four to ten percent of the population. It's about five to ten in sort of European population. So different genetic ancestries because of our population history have this. And so that's one of the things that comes into play in sort of thinking about approaches and thinking also about not exasperating health disparities through precision medicine work. If you only did your research in European ancestry populations, you might not find out about the relevant 
genomic and genetic variation in other parts of the world. So this is not, I'm not going to go into this in detail, especially because I'm looking at how, where I am in time. But this is just to say that there are a number of places that you can go to that are cataloging examples of these pharmacogenomic variants that sort of talk about genetic variation that helps you know about drug response or drug side effects or drug, um, whether or not to use a particular drug for different individuals. And Farm GKB and the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium have actually put together even um, guidelines and in more information to help sort of identify and catalog what is currently known about key pharmacogenomic findings. Okay, so another area that I wanted to touch on is precision oncology. So um, the important thing that we all need to keep in mind here is that um, when you, cancer is a disease of the genome, um, when people develop cancer, you have unregulated cell growth of cells. They can, in a solid tumor, in a solid tumor, cancers of, can form solid tumors. You can also have blood cancers. But the, the, if you look at the cells at a genomic or molecular level of the cancer, they look different from the germline, from the rest of the body. And that variation is what we call somatic variation. And so we can think about, um, you can think about the BRCA1, BRCA2 variants as variants that increase the risk of breast cancer. Those are what we call germline variants. Those are things you're born with, you inherit from your parents that impact the likelihood of your getting cancer. Somatic variation are changes in the cells that impact the tumor itself. So the tumor starts to look different from the normal tissue. And one of the things in precision oncology is studying the tumor and studying the genetic and molecular characterizations of the tumor to try to identify parts of those changes that we can then um, use to inform clinical care. And there's different ways this is used, and I'll walk through um, these different examples. So one example is has to do with using the molecular profile of the tumor to reclassify or to, to more precisely, this is this idea of precision medicine in the context of diagnose, diagnosis, to classify the tumor not just by the organ from which it arose, is this a lung cancer, is this a bre uh, breast cancer, is this what have you, but to instead look at the genetic and molecular pr profile of the tumor or, and you could imagine extending that also to lifestyle and other aspects of the individual. Is this a smoking-caused tumor or a non-smoking-caused tumor? To classify the tumors in that way. And the Cancer Genome Atlas pro Project, which is what this TCGA is, is an example. So in TCGA, they actually, in the end, we looked at over 30 different types of cancers. This was an analysis done on 12 cancers. Um, glioblastoma, head, neck, and squamous cell. I'm not going to read through all of them, but these represent the different organs in the body, looking through a, a bunch of different platforms. And then what they looked at is, uh, is they said, if we look at the cancer based on its molecular characterization and its genomics, how do they, and we tried to reclassify them as ones that are most similar, would it line up with the, um, the cell of origin, how we typically classify cancers, or would it line up differently? And what you'll find is in some cases, it was the way we expected. So all of the ovary cancers sort of grouped together, kidney cancer. But in other cases, we actually saw some convergences or divergences. So there's breast cancer, um, luminal and basal can breast cancers are as different from one another as they are from other cancers. So there's a clear separation of types of breast cancer. Similarly, if you look at, there's um, bladder cancers that look more like lung and head and neck cancer, and then there's bladder cancers that look like lung adenoma cancer. Um, and, and then there's bladder cancers that don't look like either of those. And so you can actually find a way that we see 
sub classifications of cancer that don't line up 100% with how we've traditionally classified them. And then if you go within any of these cancer types, you can start to identify subtypes that might have different prognostic response, which is prognostic is an idea of what is the likelihood of survival in that individual or predictive information, how likely is it that individual re will respond to certain types of drugs. And so you can think about reclassifying cancers based on molecular and genetic profiles. You can also think about using genetic information Again, to, this is an example of using genetic information to think about um, prognosis and whether or not individuals need chemotherapy. So this is a study, so there's a 21 gene test that predicts the, the likelihood of recurrence for hormone receptor positive women. So HR positive women, if that's the type of breast cancer that you have, if you take this 21 gene test, it's a measure of the expression of these genes within your tumor, you can actually be classified into um, low risk, intermediate, or high risk of cancer recurrence. So this is after you've had surgery, so your cancer's been removed, and the question is are you, how likely is it that your cancer is going to recur? And so obviously, if you have a high risk of cancer recurrence, chemotherapy is recommended. If you have a very low risk, then you know, alternative radiation, you, know, radiation you, you, wouldn't you wouldn't need chemotherapy. And so part of the question was, can we use, and it's called Oncotype DX. And so one of the questions was, um, there's guidelines based on that when women who meet certain guidelines should be tested. So this was looking within Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. And the first thing that they found in their population is that only 22% of the women who met the guidelines to have this testing were actually having the testing. So even though this idea was out there that you could identify um, and there were guidelines for it, it still wasn't being fully implemented. I'm not going to go into the details of potentially why or why not. Um, when they, for those who did have the testing, what happened is that 8% um, of the women were, were fell into the low risk category, 72% um, fell into the high risk, these numbers are not adding up, and so I'm a little confused for a minute. Um, but so, um, and then there was a chunk of women who fell into the intermediate risk. And so one of the first things about that is the intermediate risk is a category where the test doesn't actually give that much information. So even though we're saying, oh, here's an example where we have a precision medicine, there's still a lot of cases where the result will come back and the physician will still have, will still be in a situation of, I have to use all of the other, a lot of other information to decide is chemotherapy appropriate or not for these women. Um, but they did note in this that, um, that the recurrence risk scores correlated with use of chemotherapy. So where the test was being used, it was being, where the test was being administered, it did seem to have an impact. So the, the physicians were using that information to determine whether or not to put women on chemotherapy. And they also saw that the introduction of the test, um, so this line here shows how many women were receiving the test. And the blue line is how many women received chemotherapy. And it's a modest drop, but they did see as the test was introduced a reduction in the use of chemotherapy, which is what you would hope would happen. And you would hope not only are we reducing chemotherapy, but we're reducing chemotherapy in the appropriate groups of women who have low risk of recurrence. Um, so this slide is rather complicated, but this is getting to the idea of what is it that sort of people sort of think we should be doing if we think about this cancer precision medicine or oncology approaches. And the idea is that you're going to start off with your patient in your, no, go back. I promise I didn't press the button that time. <laughs> so you're going to start off with your patient and you're going to use some sort of omic profiling. So you're going to look at their sequence, you're going to look at the um, RNA sequence, gene expression, and other things within that. You need to then be able to, to interpret that data. And so we need to have a knowledge base from which you can grow from to interpret that, tape, that data. I don't know why this slide keeps going. 
from which you'll then make a management decision in terms of whether or not you're, what are you going to do in terms of treatment or drugs for that individual. You then want to see, did they have a response? Did they actually positively respond to the treatment that you gave them in the way that you expect? But a tricky part in, in cancer is cancer is very complicated, right? It's, it, and one of the things that happens is there'll be these examples where an immediate response occurs that's very positive, but then it doesn't, but then there's drug resistance, there's, ask, there's parts of the cancer that didn't respond that are then able to sort of grow and recur. So you need to continue to follow the patient and continue to analyze them to see if you do have drug resistance, if you do have a new, if, if you do have um, a recurrence, is there a new approach that we can take? Is there new, is the new cancer fundamentally different than what had been seen before? Okay. Um, and so what's been happening in this field is it's a little bit like the pharmacogenomics example where there's a number of different cancers for which a specific DNA mutation within the cancer, so again, not in the individual's germline, but in the cells that are part of the cancer, are, are um, give you information about a particular drug. So if you have a... Um, BCR able one fusion, then and for um, CML, then these are different drugs that you should get, and these drugs only work in individuals with this particular DNA fusion. So it's so it's a, it's ta tailoring the treatment to people who have particular molecular profiles. And this is a list of FDA approved examples of this, but we don't have that many of them now. It's kind of a promising field, but the question is. Um, is, is there more options of this and is it really going to work the way we want? And so one of the things that the National Cancer Institute is doing in response to the Precision Medicine Initiative is they're expanding their precision medicine clinical trials and doing more trials in this area. Um, they are also, I'll note at the bottom, developing a national cancer knowledge system, again, building up one of those knowledge networks in the context of somatic cancer. Um, when you talk about, I don't know why that umbrella does that. <laughs> um, it doesn't do that on my computer, but I, it did it the last time I presented and I forgot. So um, when we talk about these genetically based clinical trials in cancer, they, they're sometimes called umbrella trials and basket trials. And these differ from traditional trials. The traditional trials, you would define a cancer based on the um, you know, you might say lung cancer, and then it, people who met the eligibility cr criteria, you'd randomize some to get the drug and some not. In umbrella trials, you focus within a specific tumor type, and you look at a number of different mutations and a number of different drugs, and so you bring people into your trial, you genotype them, and if they have a particular mutation, you randomize them to a drug that you think would work for that particular mutation. So the umbrella is the idea that you're testing a, an umbrella of a bunch of different drugs within one trial, randomizing people based on the mutation that they have. In a basket trial, you're actually taking this idea that I was talking about before that maybe we're not defining our cancers correctly and that we shouldn't sort of focus on our predefined de definitions of tumor to identify who's in it, but we should look at the type of mutation. And so we should look at individuals with similar mutations no matter what type of, of um, tumor they have. So if you have a, a breast cancer or if you have a, a melanoma, if you have the same mutation, we're going to test you in this trial. We're going to put you in a basket for that mutation and test the effect of the drug on, of a single mutation in a variety of cancer types. Um, and so one example, and I put my little thing to remind us, this is an umbrella trial, is the, okay, I do not know what I did. Okay. Is the lung map trial. So this is focusing on patients with squamous cell lung cancer. Their tumor site sample is analyzed, and if they have a different mutations, based on the mutation they have, they get put in different arms of the trial, 
and then based on which are, they get put in different arms, and then each of those arms has a subarm that either gets standard chemotherapy or gets a targeted drug that might be targeted to that particular mutation. Another ex um, current trial is the precision is the NCI match trial, which is actually both an umbrella and a basket combined together. So they're bringing in individuals with solid tumors and lymphomas just across all types of tumors. Um, that no longer respond to standard treatment. They screen people for the biopsy tumor, they do gene sequencing, and then they match people to specific drugs. So they're doing multiple drugs, multiple tumor types, and again, what determines which branch people go into is the mutation that they have. And the idea is that these are gonna be trials that give us much more information about, about genomic matched trials that can be used. Okay. So I'm going to skip genomic medicine because I'm looking at the, at the clock and just say that genomic medicine is an emerging, emerging discipline that talks about using genomic information of an individual as part of their clinical care. And there's been some really positive examples, um, for example, sequencing critically ill infants to be able to identify um, and diagnose them based on sequencing data and understand what's going on with those individuals. There's also some pretty remarkable examples um, of exome sequencing and targeted therapy. This is an example of a woman who had had um, spastic paraplegia for 30 years and had never been di hadn't been diagnosed. And then when she was sequenced, it turned out that she actually had a gene that was causal for dopa respondent dystonia, which she didn't have the symptoms for. So even though and her tr and when tre treated with levodopa, she was able to walk without crutches for the first time in 17 years. And it's just an idea that how she was presenting gave one piece of information and then the genome sequencing revealed new information that was actually able to impact treatment. Okay, come on. Okay. So for cohort, and what I want to spend my last five minutes on are cohort and biobanking efforts. There's a number of examples of this. Geisinger has done uh, um, electronic health record linked biobank. There's the um, UK Biobank. There's the Million Veterans Program. These are, I actually was just in, in Qatar a couple of weeks ago um, before they banned laptops on the return flight home, I'm glad to say. And um, they are actually doing a biobank and sequencing 60,000 Qatari to, and putting together a, a um, network on that. And then there's the All of Us Research Program out of NIH. And these really are all designed to build those types of knowledge bases I was talking about, to get multidimensional information on a large number of patients. Um, so the All of Us Research Program um, is designed to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs. And it's really a national resource that's going to have this clinical information, this environmental information, the genomic information. And the gain, the idea is to, to enroll an engaged group of one million participants that reflect the United States in terms of health status, um, in terms of diversity, in terms of individuals underrepresented in biomedical research, research which is not just um, in terms of race, ethnicity, but is also in terms of socioeconomic status, is in terms of, of um, geographic area, in terms of health status, et cetera, and bring all of this data together through both direct volunteers and health care provider organizations. Originally, they're going to enroll and be consented. They're going to provide personally provided information through surveys on um, health habits, on sleep habits, on a number of different activities. They're going to have baseline measurements, including blood pressure, height, um, body weight. Bio samples are going to be stored in terms of blood and urine. And there's also going to be information coming in from apps, phones, phones and, wear, and wearables 
Um, and all of this information, all of this is also going to be put together in a way that there's tools and capabilities for not just the people funded in the project to do research, but for this to be open to researchers and citizen scientists to come in and mine that data and really try to make knowledge gains based on the information that's brought in. Um, right now, the program is organized. Um, the, I mentioned the biosamples. Um, it's going to go to Mayo Clinic. It's going to be, if things go as planned, over 35 million vials, so a million people, about 35 vials per person. It's pretty impressive if you look at what they're building up um, at the Mayo Clinic. There's a data and research center that's um, out of Vanderbilt working with Verily, which is formerly Google um, Genomics and the Broad Institute, who really are in charge of putting all of this data together, curating it, and setting up the secure environment to allow research to happen. There's um, a participant center that's involved in bringing in direct volunteers along with healthcare provider organizations that are recruiting people from their um, healthcare providers. And I will note that it's, it includes everything from large regional medical centers, the University of Arizona, University of Chicago, et cetera, and also federally qualified health centers that wouldn't necessarily usually be engaged in this type of large-scale research. Um, the Participant Technology System Center is doing all of the web and phone phone-based platforms. Um, this has to do with how the electronic consent will be administered, how the questionnaires are being administered, long-term engagement and retention, and sort of creating that interface with the participants. And then community and engagement partners who are being brought in to educate, enroll, and retain participants, which are actually currently under review. This is just our map sort of showing where all of these people, where all of these are located. The, the um, VA is there, and I will completely admit that they got their symbol put here to sort of um, hide the fact that we don't have great representation from the Pacific Northwest. If you look at this closely, we also actually don't have great representation in the Deep South. And one of the things that we're working towards is trying to identify how to get organizations in to really also represent those parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all of the values. Um, I've touched on a number of them already, for example, reflecting the diversity. Um, and But there's a huge focus in this program on the participants and having the participants as partners in the program engaged with transparency and their access to their own in information about their data and themselves. And part of this is a change in approach in how we think about um, participant participation, and some of this is also a hope that in doing this in this way, they'll be engaged in a way that we can have this long-term interaction and this long-term involvement where we can continue to get data, continue to build on this database, and recognize that we need the participants' involvement in order for that to work. Um, there's privacy and trust principles and a data security policy principles and framework that came out of the centralized White House efforts when the Precision Initiative was started. And we really see this as a catalyst for innovative research programs and policies like these other knowledge-based networks. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, I took that slide away. So the Precision Medicine Initiative was announced by um, former President Obama at the um, the White House, and what I took away is that, I'm sorry, at the State of the Union Address, and the slide that I took away is that the All of Us Research Program that I'm describing is, a, is one of the main components of the Precision Medicine Initiative. It's the NIH-led portion. There is additional stuff at the FDA, at the Office of the National Coordinator, and other places within the government that are part of this larger Precision Medicine Initiative. We need the microphone. And all of this will be done that you're talking about, this hope and this wonder, mm -hmm. will be done as the new administration whacks the hole bigger than God out of the funding bucket. Right. So, um, <laughs> 
So I will say that we don't know for sure. And the one thing that we do know, so I'm going to skip, I skipped over surveys show that there's public support for this. This is funded through the 21st Century Cures Act. So one of the things, the mantra that we say currently all the time at the NIH, and it's partially for our own um, sanity, yeah, is that the president recommends a budget. As a member of the executive branch, I, I, am a, I support the president's budget in my official capacity, but I remind myself that Congress is who actually implements and puts forward the actual budget and appropriations. And so the, um, the, so we're in a period of, of not, you know, not knowing where it's going to actually wind up, but this particular initiative, this all of us research program as part of the precision medicine initiative is actually directly funded through the 21st Century Cures Act. So the 21st Century Cures Act was signed into law on December 13th, 2016, um, authorizing an additional 1.5 billion of funding over 10 years for the precision medicine initiative activities, which includes this cohort program. The question of if the NIH, so it's possible for the NIH budget to be reduced with this still being specified as an area that needs to be funded. Um, and then, and so within that, this is the number of millions of dollars um, per year for this cohort. It was the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program, ranging from 40 million in 2017 to a maximum of 419 million in 2023. Um, and this was, uh, this, this does have bipartisan support. Now I will say, it has to still be appropriated on a year-to-year -year basis. So there, I'm not saying it's set, but there is a level of bipartisan support for this, not for the NIH in general, and for this particular activity that is allowing us to continue to move forward even in the light of what you're alluding to. The uh, research that you're describing is going to come out of many different institutions, each yes. of which has its own version of an electronic, electronic health record. Yes. None of which are interoperable with the other, or a few of them are. Right. Now, is part of the effort then going to promote interoperability? Yes. Uh, so that the data that is generated in site A can be tra appropriately transmitted to the other sites? Yes. So, and so that's being done in two ways, and then I'm going to, I'm realizing um, Max, is it okay if I take three more minutes? I'm a little over my time, I apologize. So there's two ways in which that's happening. Within the program itself, if you go back to my map where I was calling out the different um, centers, they were to a certain extent selected based on an ability to produce data to a certain standard. We sort of had um, a focus on that. So the health provider organizations are working together to create things that are interoperable. But then I also discussed that we're bringing in direct volunteers. Um, um, former President Obama, when putting this forward, was like, I want anybody who wants to be part of this study to be able to sign up for this study. So there's an initiative going on through NIH, the Office of the National Coordinator, and also there's a fair amount of con contributions from research at Harvard, doing a project called Sync for Science, which is helping to allow individuals working off of blue button technology, which is a way that people can sort of, you know, everyone has a right to their own data, electronic health data, and it's a way to get that data in a way that it can be easily incorporated into this, and there's lots of aspects to that of interoperability and also equivalency that's going to need large amounts of, of infrastructure building and research and time to make it work, but that's part of what this program is actually doing and part of where the research is, because if we can't get that, then we can't do some of the other types of research that we're doing. Did that answer your question? And then there's so much data being shared and being collected, which is 
incredible. Uh -huh. But is there any concern or has anyone addressed the issue of what happens if the servers are compromised or if the data is hacked and what contingencies are in place for those potential? Because someone at some point is going to try and hack this data. Yes. So, so one of the reasons, okay, so let me just get, I'm going to just, this is going to be my last slide. I had the slide on some of the, the but we're going to talk about them for the whole day, so you don't need to hear my thing. So one of the things is we haven't enrolled anybody yet in the study, and part of the reason we haven't enrolled anybody yet is that we need to make sure we have all of those types of things worked out. And so there's a um, large amount of work that's being done right now in terms of getting um, an authority to operate. It's one of those acronyms I was about to be like an ATO, an authority to operate, which doesn't actually fully address your question, but the security levels and the secu height of security that the data center that Vanderbilt and Verily and Broad are working on together with the um, precision, with the technology group that's setting up the smartphone, this, they're being put to a very high standard. They're having external testing where people are coming in. They have threat assessments. They have a whole plan to make this as, as secure as possible. That said, I work for the government, right? I worked for the government when my when when all of our data got hacked and I who you know we all every single you know and the data is in the hands of the Chinese is what I understand although it's not sure. You know, I don't know that the guarantee the guarantee can't be there. It would be wrong for me to stand up and say, "Oh, that's a guarantee." Um, but I will say that what that a lot of work is being done to minimize those threats and to work with the best ability that we have to do that. Because there is a recognition that it would be a target. Um. And of course, there's a, real, there's a real tension between making the data widely available, right. such as to citizen scientists, in a way that still makes sure that the basic data security is adhered to. Yes. So. And, 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 par and there's different levels of that as well. To, you know, the, the part of that is tiering what data is available to different groups of people. You know, so when we say data is going to be available to citizen scientists, it's not like they're going to have access to the, to the raw base of the data. You know, there's different levels of, of, of analysis and security of, of, ty of de -ident not de-identifying, but minimizing the identifiability of the data that's also going to be put into place um, in terms of, ha of what becomes accessible to different people. Okay. I would like to talk <coughs> about what I think is a cultural blind spot in mm -hmm. the biomedical community. Uh, and uh, it's this, that we all are oriented toward classifying our experiences Right. As you so eloquently said, uh, and I remember as a young cardiologist learning that, that uh, hypokalemia aggravates digoxin toxicity. But it's been interesting to me that no one has ever asked to or seen, sought to quantify that relationship, mm -hmm. except in a poor study that we did a number of years ago, which tends to say that if your potassium is three, it only takes about half as much digoxin mm -hmm. to get you toxic as it does if your potassium is five. There's a whole other culture of quantitative approaches through stochastic adaptive control of mm -hmm. systems. You see it in the aerospace industry especially. And all of this can be brought into the area of optimal drug management. Right. Where you model the behavior of the drug and the responses of the patient. And you will not be led astray by the errors in genetic testing right. where you see a patient behave in a certain way and you test and you find that that gene, uh, the thing, isn't there that you thought was there. Right. That's the payoff of looking at the drug behavior and controlling that and um, focusing on that clinically. Yeah. And I think that's an important area where we need to go. It's not taught in medical schools. They actively resist it. Decision analysis is not taught in medical schools. They actively resist that. Yeah. I think these are two areas that really sadly need improvement. Can we? Can you send me back in my slides? I just wanted to go back for one moment. In I, you raise a very good point. Do you have control of my slides back there? Keep going back. I'll tell you when to stop. Here. So one of the things. Um, 
that I think is important as you think about building up these different um, knowledge-based resources is that they will, again, it's not just, it's not this genomics and the, where we are right now in pharmacogenomics is a simplification. And one of the hopes as you think about what can be done is to ask some of those later questions. So like when it talks here, you know, this is saying, this isn't saying just identify variation that predicts response to community. It's actually talking about identifying the causes of that. And I think that in, in, ingrained in that is a little bit of what you're saying. We can start at the, okay, you have this variant, you don't respond, you have this variant, you do that's the end of the story, or we can say, okay, what do we learn from deep diving deeper into having that? And so if we set up this knowledge base and we can then identify a large group of people who have the variant, you could then enroll them, you can have them identified and enroll them in a sub-study to do the kind of research that you're talking about, to look at them more closely and to look and to inform the, un the basic biology to study it more. Mm -hmm. in poorly designed clinical trials, mm -hmm. which are not too far from, let's examine three courses of flying an airplane from LA mm -hmm. to JFK. And we will study this and report on the percent of successful arrivals at JFK. And so many of our <laughs> clinical trials are that blind mm -hmm. to anything else that happens. Nobody cares what the winds aloft like the genetic composition right. does to the behavior of the plane. The idea is to know where the plane is and control it. And that's the difference, a very key difference in the approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I apologize for going over, um, but no, I think I'll, I'll just end with, you can go to the summary slide. I'm having huge troubles with this clicker. Um, I, I mean, I think my final, keep going. So again, we're, we're gonna, these are all the things we're going to be talking about all day. Two more slides. Last, okay. So I mean, I think I just want to say, I just want to stress again that genomics is only one facet of precision medicine. And I just want to have that clear because I think that the two sometimes get, get considered equivalent. And my talk focused on genomics because it's leading the field, but it's not the only thing that's there. And also to really also recognize that this, this knowledge system and knowledge de base development is a key aspect of what's happening in the research component. That's with the idea that that's going to feed into all of this. And then also, even though I didn't touch on them, there's so many, and we've touched on a couple of them in the questions, there's so many social, ethical, and legal and policy implications around both the research and what's being done in considering these knowledge bases, and then also in the implementation of what does it mean to say we're going to start to put this forward. How are we addressing health disparities? How are we addressing regulatory issues? How are we addressing is this the right, are we making a simple choice about a drug that's not the right choice, et cetera, that I hope we sort of expand on and talk about more over the day. So thank you all. Thank, let's thank, that's an excellent presentation. Um, great overview and it was worth going uh, a few minutes past our allotted time. We will take a short break Peter, now. Let's, let, let's break until 10.15 because we have a long okay. lunch which we designed so that we can cut Good. into it. Good. So you, you'll have a full 15 minute break. We'll see you back at 10.15. Thank you.